You'd think I'm half crazy because I truly love to be in the Lord's house. I love it as much as living, I think. And uh, without him, I wouldn't have a life. So to me, it makes perfect sense. Without the Lord, I'd have no pleasure anywhere in this world. Turn with us to Genesis chapter 41. Let's stand across the building tonight. Man, I... Some people got over their experience with God, but I just couldn't. I didn't. I'm still in much, as much in love with Him as I ever have been. And thank God for His continued mercy that endures forever. Amen. Great is His faithfulness. Genesis chapter 41. Look with us here in verse 33. We left off this morning. Bible says, And, and now therefore, Pharaoh, look out, a man discreet and wise and set him over the land of Egypt and let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seventh in the seven plenteous years and let them gather all the food of those good years that come and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities and that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine which shall be in the land of Egypt that the land perish not throughout or through the famine and in the and the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this is? And a man in whom the Spirit of God is. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according to thy word shall my people be ruled only in thy in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set this thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures and fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. Let's pray. God, we thank you, Lord, for the great day you've given us. Thank you for your many blessings in life. We pray, God, that you would overshadow us tonight. Help us, God. Hide us behind the cross and preach through us and use us. God, that you might encourage your church, that you might uplift them and father we pray if there's any lost god that you would meet that need and that you draw them to an order of prayer we give you all the honor lord in jesus lovely name and amen you may be seated we thank you for standing to honor the lord this evening we continue this series on joseph's uh, the life of joseph we want to look tonight on joseph in the palace this morning joseph was before pharaoh and we're going to continue there for just a second uh, if anybody had ever had a dealing with a person like joseph he would be a friendly person i mean to tell you i, I don't find throughout the word of god where he wasn't unfriendly but i also find this he's the type of person you'd want to work for you He's the type of person you'd want to be around you and in your company because in the reality of things, when he sees a problem, he doesn't just blot out, yep, that's the problem, go about his business, but he also tends to a solution. The Bible says here in verse 33 that after he tells him Pharaoh's dream, tells him exactly what it means, tells him the years of plenty that would come and the years of famine that would follow, he tells him, he says, now look out for a man. Here's what you want to find, Pharaoh. He's, he's going to give Pharaoh the grace uh, grace's blueprint if you will he says look out for a man that's discreet and wise and set him over the land of Egypt and, and let Pharaoh do this let him point officers over the land and take up a fifth part of the land in Egypt or a fifth part of all that is taken up and the years that are plenteous when the good years come let them gather all the food and the good things to come let them lay up and store a fifth part of that under Pharaoh's hand and let him keep it in the food in the cities keep the the food in the city store it up for those times he is literally laying before them the blueprint for them if could you imagine as this is being uh, um, witnessed unto the day as this is being spoken of as 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 this Hebrew boy they've pulled out of the out of the middle of a prison cell and set him there he's had enough time to bathe himself to clean himself up they've changed his garments not into anything royal but not into prison clothes 
clothes either. So now he's standing before Pharaoh as he's standing there. He says, Pharaoh, this is exactly what you need in life. This is exactly the blueprint, what you're going to have to do for the problem that is at hand. And now remember, this all stemmed from Pharaoh's bad dream. And this, this is in the life of Joseph. We've seen him go from the pasture field to the pit and from the pit into Potiphar's and back into the prison. And now he stands before Pharaoh this morning and this evening. He's standing before Pharaoh yet, but he's standing in a different position now. He's explained the dream, but more than that, in, in an uncandid way, and the Holy Spirit is guiding Joseph. People don't believe in the Spirit before uh, the day of Pentecost, but I've got news for you. The Bible says that he moved across the waters in, uh, in Genesis chapter 1, that the Holy Spirit always was. The Trinity always will be. It, it has been established from the foundation of the world. He was there. And so I believe that he moves upon Joseph to even take it further than just saying this is the problem or this is the interpretation but he takes it and says well this is what needs to be done about it this is the solution to the problem now if you believe that God is the one that can interpret the dream Pharaoh then you must surely believe that God would give me the wisdom to tell you what the repair what the fix or what the 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 goodness that can come of it because when you look for just a moment and think of a famine that would strike the land in so much that animals would not have food and that water would dry up and that there would be nothing left and if you read closely in this word you'll find in the end part of this chapter that the famine begins it grows and that the people have food and then the people of Egypt don't have food and then they seek to Pharaoh because Pharaoh stored this up in a safe place and the Bible says that the famine was across the world that it was everywhere it wasn't just in one spot this was a humongous a massive a global famine that has touched the earth at this time and here is a nation who will be blessed because Joseph has stood now in the palace and saying here is God's grace and his blueprint for you and I grace literally is the undeserved the un unmerited favor of God in our life think about it for just a minute here this evening the Egyptians were not God's people and here's one Hebrew boy or young man who's standing before him at the age of 30 years old. These people weren't looking for God. They didn't deserve any grace from God. They didn't even know who God was. They worshipped animals. They worshipped frogs. They worshipped the sun. And here's a young Hebrew man standing here saying, I've got the solution to what's coming. You can reject it. You can go on about it. You'll have seven good years. But at the end of seven plenteous years, you'll find such a famine will grab and grip, and grip this world. It will shake us to our core and people will die. I would to God that someone we don't have the ability God has not revealed it to any man because the Bible says no man knoweth the hour but if we could see for just a minute how close things really were I promise you we'd all live a little bit different tonight oh God help me if they could look from the bars and from the streets and outside of the realm of this church and this facility and the house of God all across this land and they could see a stopwatch in the sky and they could notice oh that God is coming back soon that we've got years or maybe weeks or God help us just hours or days before we go to meet our creator all of us would look to some solution all of us would look to be prepared and to be ready and to resemble what God has laid before us because the reality is is that Joseph is here and saying listen there is a blueprint there's the right way to do this and there's going to be a wrong way to do this. Uh, one of the hardest things we have in society today is everybody wants to be right on their own way. Everybody wants to take a different way to get to the same place. But I promise you, you can't do it. You can't do it. it life doesn't work that way and neither does Christian living. Neither does getting to heaven. There's still only one way to heaven and that is through and by Jesus. Jesus Christ, the blood that was shed on Calvary. He said in Acts 4 and 12, For there is no other name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. It is the reality that we have. You say, well, preacher, there has to be some tolerance. There has to be some gray area. There has to be. What about all those other things? Honey, we've, we have suffered too long from weak doctrine. He said that there are those that are carried about with every wind of doctrine, every doctrine of devils, every seducing spirit that would 
overcome. The reality is the hardest thing to face is without Jesus Christ we will die lost. There must be within the blueprint of Christ that He has laid before us. And the world, I would say if anybody, if I could ask anybody, if I stopped them on the side of the street, if I blocked them at Walmart and said, you'll have to answer this question before you could get home, before I let you leave. Do you want to be blessed? That's it. Everybody would say, well, absolutely. You'd have a couple carnal people out there just to be mean and hateful, say no. But the reality is everybody wants to be blessed. We want the favor of God. Well, they won't say God. They just want favor. They want, let me use some language that the world would use. They want a good hand dealt to them. Amen. But the reality is, is everybody wants the blessing of this life without the reality that there's another one yet to come. He said in, in Psalms chapter 1, in verse 1, that blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. If you need to seek counsel, it can never come from the ungodly. We are the ones that hold the keys to the kingdom. We are the ones that have the Word of God in our life. It literally is the blueprint of grace before our eyes. He said, walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and he will del- and he doth meditate in it day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. He shall bring forth his fruit in his season, and his leaf shall also wither, shall also not wither, and sh- whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. I am telling you, we need a church like that again. Amen. Churches are drying up because we have carnal Christians on every side. But the reality is, is God didn't call us to be in the conformity of the world, but that we should be into the form and the transforming under the image of Christ and under the body of God. And He says that if we want to be blessed, we'll not know, we'll not ignore, we'll, we'll not stand in the way of sinners, we'll not, uh, we'll not block their pathway, we'll not take the counsel of the ungodly, but we'll not sit in the seat of the scornful, but we will be planted by the uh, river of waters. Buddy, you be planted where water can run. Here's the water of life. Here's the thing that brings essence uh, and nutrients to us. He is saying literally, if you've ever seen a low spot, almost kind of like you're driving up the road to Hamlin, the lows there over on the other side of Griffithsville. I don't know of any gigantic waters around there, but when it rains, the waters come out of the banks all the time. But I promise you this, all the way down to Hamlin, you'll see those hay fields. If they were to take those hay fields out and put corn fields there, they'd be prosperous. If they were to take those out and put bean fields, they'd be prosperous. They could plant wheat down there and it'd be prosperous because they're planted by the waters. You want to know what we need today? We need to plant our feet by the living waters of God. Hey, listen, when those things flood against us, there's a blueprint to Christian living. We need to plant our feet by the living waters of life. And as the waters come, buddy, listen, when dry times come, we'll make it. When the hard times come, we'll make it. When the floods come, he said, they'll not overflow thee. Honey, you can't get too close to the river of life. Amen. I think you ought to get close enough to drink. And I like to see those old trees grow out of the riverbank. They just got to turn right up over the river. I mean to tell you, just nestle me up next to the Lord. Hey, listen, in the life that comes out of Him. But the Bible also says that if you want to be blessed, and you will be in your season, that you need to be planted there. He says, but the ungodly are not so. He says that which the chaff and the wind driveth away, therefore the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish. We we, we, we think within our world today that, that we can just do anything we want, build anything we want. We, in the church that I came from, they're a great church, a wonderful church, still growing, still being blessed. Well, I, right before I got there, there was an old building on the side of the road. They were going to tear it down, down the, in the next township. And one of the men was driving by. They were running bulldozers and everything up. And he pulled up and said, what are you going to do with this building? And they told him, they said, we'll just mow it down. He said, well, can I have it? We'll give it to the church. He said, sure. So the church went there. They disassembled the building. No blueprints. Took everything 
they could, took it back to the church lot and built what we called the Shouter House. Hey, listen, it was a long building about the size of this with garage doors on the side you can open up. It was like an enclosed picnic shelter. We called it the Shouter House. Our church would overflow at that time. We didn't have nowhere to go. People were standing. The people were standing outside of the church, so we went across to the Shouter House and filled that up. God kept blessing. You know what amazes me is we put it together. No blueprints. Hey, listen, some people just knew what they were doing. They counted how many trusses they had and thought this is how many feet we can pour, boys. And they started putting the poles up. Someone knew what they were doing. When it comes to grace, God knew what He was doing. It didn't take you. It didn't take me. It didn't take any of us. God ordained it. God made the grace blueprint and said, this is the way that I'll establish it. It may not be acceptable by man, but I'll send my son to die on the cross of Calvary. He'll pay the price for everyone, irregardless whether ungodly, undone, unrighteous, wicked, lost. He said, but I'm going to make this blueprint and if they can accept my son as their Savior, literally, I'll forgive them of their sins. I'll wash them and make them new. I'll take them from something filthy and ugly and put them into the house of God. I'll clean them up and do all that I can do with them. But we need to understand it has to be done to grace's blueprint. It has to be done the way that God has ordained things to be. And then the society which we find today and the Bible says in 2 Peter in chapter number 2 in verse number 8 I think it is or excuse me verse number 4 he said if God spared not the angels that sinned but cast them down to hell and delivered them in the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment and spared not the old world but saved Noah and eight persons a preacher righteousness bringing into the flood upon the world of ungodly if God did that if God did that and turning aside the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes and condemned them with an overthrow making them an example to those that are after that they should live uh, that they shouldn't live ungodly and delivered just lot vexed with filthy conversation of the wickedness from a righteous man dwelleth among them in seeing and hearing vex the righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds if the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust to the day of judgment to be punished. You better re get this reality this morning, this evening. There will be a judgment come. It will not be according to your pastor's words. I mean to tell you, there's some pastors that are okay fornication. They're okay drug use. They're okay anything that they're involved with. They're okay all kinds of stuff today. It doesn't matter what we okay what matters is that we and the life we live measures up with the word of God and the grace that he has set before us because if God spared not Noah and God spared not the angels what makes us so high and mighty today that people think that they can stand up and change the word of God he said if you would take away from it I'll take your name out of the book of life and if you add to it I'll add the plagues of Egypt upon you I'm telling you listen of this book upon you. We need today to understand that grace had a blueprint for you and I. It is lined up for you and I. God's grace is a setup and a system for you and I and the world and people and a person who could come but the person or the people or the world who rejects God will not receive the grace of God. He says um, here, oh listen in, in verse number 6, of Second Peter, or excuse me, 9, he says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver them out of temptations and to reserve the unjust to the day of judgment to be punished. You better be sure of this tonight. You will, no one will get by with sin unchecked and unannounced. You will not. You can hide it from your pastor. You can hide it from the deacons. You can hide it from the church. Hey, Amen. You can hide it from your organization. Well, we'll preach since they'll put us online. We can, they can preach against their associations, their organizations. 
organizations, they can hide it from whatever they want to. Say amen. Hey, it's getting good. But the reality is you will not hide it from God. There's a grace a blueprint that has been placed. God knows everything that goes on. It was the prophet Amos in chapter 7 that had seen the vision of God. And when he seen God, he seen him standing. He looked out and seen God standing against the wall. And while he was standing there, he had a plumb line in his hand and he placed it against the wall. And he said, um, and Amos begin to see it and begin to realize uh, when God comes back, he's not coming back to build anything. He's going to come back to make sure it measures up with the blueprint that he has put in place set before us and anything other than that will be cast aside my lord pastor you think that is hard preaching and i think that's good preaching hey grace has got a blueprint you might think you can abuse it you might think you can use it for your glory for your vain but the reality is is there is a blueprint that god has laid and established and god will not be mocked the bible said he is long suffering but whatsoever a man soweth that so shall he reap Hey, listen, He has laid it out perfectly for you and I. If heaven would be our home, it's only because we've accepted the grace of God given by His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the blueprint of heaven. He is everything that you and I are up to today, that we are completely today. And Joseph is telling him, if you want to survive this, here's what you need to do. I've never seen this before in all my life, but I realize it today. Here's a man that Pharaoh, has pulled out of prison at the age of 30 years old. He's a nobody. He's from another country. And all of a sudden, he can tell him what his dream means and he takes it a step further and says, if you want to make it out all right, if you want to lead this nation and leave a statue somewhere, you better do it this way. Don't keep four tenths back. Amen. Don't you dare only put away for six years, but you better put away for all seven of the years that you've done because that that is what God has commanded us to do. But we will not work out. It will not benefit us to try to do things our way. We've got to do it God's way. We must do it God's way. Without that, it will absolutely, utterly fail and not work out to benefit us. We need to have grace's blueprint in our life. The Bible continues on here as as Joseph is telling Pharaoh, not only he says, well, this is what you need to do, this is what you need to do to be safe, but then we see Pharaoh here looks to his servants. Verse 38, And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and as wise as thou art. So he looks to his servants and says, Has anybody ever seen something like this? Has anybody ever heard of someone who has the ability to interpret a dream and then see the next 14 years of our future and to know it to an accurate pinpoint and to give it to the, uh, the description and to give it to the ability that they, when they hear it, understand that he's not making it up. He's not guessing for answers. He's not guessing for words. He knows exactly what is going to happen shown by the hand of God and Pharaoh's looking around at his servants. I don't know who they are. They could have been the handmaidens. It could have been all the potiphers of his life. It could have been all the rulers and say can anybody find anything that is even closely remote to this? And nobody has anything. Of course he's already asked all his magicians. He's already asked all of his wise men. He's in, and listen, in that day and age, I promise you, you don't want to make nothing up. They'd feed you to the lions. And what we find as we begin to read this as he's telling him, Pharaoh shows, says, is there anybody else like this? For thou shalt be over my house and according to thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in thy throne will I be greater than thou. So we find that grace's blueprint is shown as Joseph is now in the palace. But more than that, we find a gracious blessing that is given unto Joseph. Now I don't know how blessed you feel being a Christian today, but let me tell you for a second, this man, it would, it, it would have been nice for 
for Joseph just to get out of prison. Matter of fact, I think it'd been good Joseph get out of the prison just for that. It would have been nice. It would have been it would have been cool maybe to get a job working for Pharaoh, maybe collect a, a salary or maybe something to do where he's not laying inside a dungeon anymore. He's not saying and he's not in fetters and he's not in shackles. He's not in these things. Uh, could you imagine for just a minute his expectation of what he could get? Maybe, maybe, maybe even get a job out of getting out of prison. But this gracious blessing is far above all that. The Bible says, he said, Joseph, I'm going to make you ruler. Underneath me you shall be and all of my household except for the throne. He ran even Pharaoh's home. Everything except for the throne was under his rule and more than that the blessing continues Pharaoh says unto Joseph see I've set thee over all that is in the land of Egypt and Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures and fine linen and put a gold of chain about his neck and he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had they carried they cried before him they bowed the knee and he made him ruler over the lands of Egypt when Joseph has now gone from the pit, uh, from the pasture down into a pit. He's been sold into slavery to Potiphar's house. Potiphar has cast him back into a prison. And now he's found himself in the palace. Hallelujah. He is, stays gone from one extreme to the next. He's gone from the pit to the palace. Oh, seemingly overnight. And now he's standing. I wonder if Joseph thinks, man, can this be true? Until finally Pharaoh takes off his ring and slides it upon his finger and he calls for his he calls for his servants and they bring him a new robe it wasn't like his daddy's coat but it was a little bit different they they put shoes on his feet they bid in to adorn him and put a necklace about his neck i picture this great big symbol i don't know like mr t or something like that and it wasn't no cheap necklace honey it was a real thing hey listen to me i came to get saved i came to an altar of prayers a 19 year old boy for one reason I did not want to burn in hell. I did not want to die lost in my sin. I did not want to get troubled. But oh, when I begin to serve God, I found a gracious blessing far beyond the pits of hell could ever entail or look beyond. When I begin to serve God, I begin to realize all the things He had in store for His people. God's not interested in us changing sights to be a, a slave from one master to the other, but God's interested in you and I all oh, that when we come and he might have a gracious blessing in our life Jesus said in John that hey, the devil came to steal to kill and to destroy but I have come that you might have life and might have it more abundantly it is the blessing of God the gracious blessing that comes from God oh listen hey, Joseph might have lost his coat back there that his father gave him but he never left the calling that his father had gave him amen hey listen now he's there gone from the pit to the palace uh, kind of like the, the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15 the Bible said he left, spent all that he had and there was a famine in the land he says I know what I'll do I'll go to my father's house uh, my, uh, why, why would I tarry here when my father's servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger he goes back to the father the Bible says the father saw him afar off and went and ran and kissed him, fell upon his neck uh, he said father I'm no more worried worthy to be called thy son. Hallelujah. You remember what you thought you'd tell God when you ran to the altar. You remember you thought you, that God wouldn't love you as much. But when you got there, you found the blessings of God. You got up and all of a sudden the sky looked brighter. The birds sounded sweeter. The grass looked greener because you found out He wasn't interested in your pain, your problems or your persecutions. God wanted you to come and surrender yourself to Him. The Bible says the prodigal son comes. The father looks to his servant. He don't say get a robe. He don't say get in the in the war out drawer. He says go get the best robe. Hey, listen in shoes and put him on his feet and put a ring on his hand. And he looked to him and said, Go and kill the fatted calf. I'm telling you, listen, and what would the son wanted? The Bible said the son wanted to be a servant. Make me as one of thy hired servants. But when he came, in contact with the Father. He made him a son again. Hallelujah! Aren't you glad that God pulled us from slavery when we wanted to be a servant and He made us a servant?
Amen. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, that's all I wanted to be was a servant. I didn't care. Just put me in rags and let me be a slave the rest of my life. I had a horrible taskmaster, taskmaster of the world. Oh, it treated us so badly. All I wanted to do was escape from the pits of hell. You may not know what I'm talking about tonight. You might have been a good child. You might not have gotten any trouble. You might have had good morals and raised up right and never strayed too far from the home or from the family. I read in the Bible, the Bible said in 1 Samuel, chapter 30 that David has gone out to battle when he comes back all the town is gone his wives are gone his belongings are gone and they begin to seek after him after they have a huge pity party the Bible said David encourages himself in the Lord he gets up and he takes off while they get to the enemy they're trailing the enemy they're not sure which way to go but they're heading that direction they find an Egyptian boy hallelujah they find an Egyptian boy down there and they say the Bible says they feed him they give him water they give him things to drink and finally he comes to himself he gets his strength he said I was sick and my master left me here to die oh God hey listen he says David oh David tells him can you tell me where the enemy's camp is he said I'll tell you as long as you don't make me go back to my master as long as you don't send me back where I come from I'm glad the gracious blessing is God hey and interested in sending us back to the old master. God wants to keep us right in the house of God. He don't want us to go astray. He wants us to be a son. God don't want to get rid of us any more than anything else in life. I'm glad that I ran to escape hell, but I found a gracious blessing. I mean to tell you, I, I hurt sometimes for people who war so hard with salvation. They think that they have to be perfect. They think that they can't do it. And they think that they can't live it. The reality is none of us can. Except for the grace and the power of God. None of us can. Someone said, I I fail the Lord. We all fail the Lord. When Satan comes knocking and begins to discourage you, and tell you you are nobody, you remember that you're a child of God. You remember, you say, well, pastor, do you think it's all right to continue in sin? He said, God forbid. Hey, man, that's what he said in Romans. We ought to quit our sin and we ought to act right. We ought to do right. But thank God for His grace and His mercy. I mean to tell you, we ought to be the people of God. And if the Bible says that if we are the people of God, He said, everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. I'm not preaching a soft gospel. I'm telling you, there's a gracious blessing in the hand of God. And we need to understand what it is and reach for it and obtain it. Aren't you glad you're in the house of God tonight? Aren't you glad He saved you? That He that He changed you? That He made you a new creature? Aren't you glad that you left the lying and the cussing and the fornicating and the pain and the suffering of sin and the sorrow of this world on the outside and now you can look to heaven where your help comes from. You can look up and know that we've got a better place one day after a while. That's the greatest, that's the gracious blessing is that we can know that we were a child of a king and my best day down here is going to be my worst day over there I've got something we're looking for over there the Bible says not only does Joseph I mean when Joseph comes when he comes into a room the Bible says that the the knees begin to bow around him. He made him ruler over all the land. Pharaoh had said unto Joseph, he says, there's nothing that you can't do. He says, you lift your hand or your foot to the land of Egypt. Whatever you do, no one will lift a hand or a foot to you. All that you have, and more than that, it, Joseph has gone all these things down from the pit into Potiphar's. He thought he had something good and it looks like the bottom drops out. He goes back into the prison and now he's standing in the palace he literally he has found uh, he has found grace's blueprint in the eyes of Pharaoh he's found a gracious blessing but this last point I want you to look for just a moment the Bible says and Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphaniah Phaniah he, and he gave unto him his wife Asenath and, and, uh, or Asenath and the daughter of Potiphar the priest of 
on and Joseph went out over the land of Egypt and Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. Now the Bible goes on to say that the plan that he had told them about, they begin to implement, they begin to get blessed. Their harvest is, their harvest is in a good year. Their harvest is great years. The Bible says that they had handfuls that were coming. I mean to tell you, and the Bible says that at the end of seven years, it became to the place that he quit numbering how much grain and how much corn that he had. He stopped numbering it. Verse 49, it says, for it was without number. He had so much stuff piled up. But listen to this. The find, we find this tonight, that not only is he graciously blessed, but Pharaoh takes it a step further and gives him a wife. We find that Joseph here, he takes himself what's called a Gentile bride. It's a Gentile bride because she don't know nothing about God. She don't know she ain't God's people. She's a Gentile. Honey, you and I were Gentiles. We weren't Jews. We learned in Romans as we studied on Wednesday night. Anything other than a Jew was a Gentile. So he took himself a Gentile bride. That wasn't, a, how can I say this, popular in the day. As a matter of fact, it wasn't okay in the day. But here we find that Rebecca was a Gentile believer. And well, you know who else we find that was a Gentile? Rahab was a Gentile. Here's another one. Ruth was a Gentile. The Bible said that Ruth and Naomi sojourned into a distant land. All that Naomi and her husband Amalek had children. Their sons married Moabite women. And she was a Gentile. But Ruth, the Bible says when they died and she said, I'm going back to my country. Orpha turned, kissed her and walked away. But Naomi said, where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Hallelujah. And there she walked back into the house or the people of God. And when she got there, hallelujah, the Bible said that when she got there, she seen one who seen her by the name of Boaz. And when Boaz got there, he looked and he said, there's one nearer than I. And the one that should have redeemed her, rejected her. Oh God. Hey, listen, Jesus came to His own and His own rejected Him. So He took Himself a Gentile bride. Honey, that's you and I. When His own received or rejected Him, He gave the invitation to you and I that us common people, us the outcast of Israel, the dog of the commonwealth, that the Gentile could walk into the house of God. The veil was torn from top to bottom. The high priest is done away with and now we have a high priest. We have a temple not made with hands. Hallelujah. We, he took a Gentile bride that we could have a home in heaven too. The Bible said Ruth was rejected of her first. He said that I can't take her, at least I mar my own inheritance. Oh, and Boaz says, fine. And he plucked off his shoe, as was custom in the day. And he stood before the elders and said, I'll redeem her. <laughs> I'll buy all that's hers. I'll buy all that's in her. Aren't you glad Jesus bought all that was ours? He paid the price. He listened, didn't just die for some of us. He died for all of us tonight. He didn't just die for some of our sin. He was crucified. He was bruised. He was beaten for our iniquity. Not just some of our iniquity. All our iniquity. Hallelujah. For we were righteous. We were unrighteous. We were ungodly. And still yet Christ died for us. Aren't you glad? He took a Gentile bride unto Himself. I'm so thankful that He took a Gentile bride as Joseph did. Joseph got a bride. I mean, you want to talk about a blessing. His blessings just keep coming, coming and coming in his life. I mean, it's a great thing. I, I, I guess some people, some people might disagree with me to find a bride. The Bible said man finds a virtuous woman. Far, far above ruby. Her price is far above rubies. You're finding something. He didn't have to look out. It was put right in front of him. All he did was have to accept it. Wasn't it Rebecca when Isaac was looking for a wife? He said if she would take it, if she'll accept it, you bring her back with you. She had to accept it. The Gentile bride still has to accept whether or not she'll be betrothed to the other one or not. 
The Bible said in Ephesians chapter number 5 and verse uh, 25, Husbands, love your wife as Christ has loved the church and gave Himself for it, that He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the Word, that He might present to Himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. I'm glad that God decided that when He looked down on you and I, that He would take a Gentile bride unto himself that he literally would look upon us who you know it is a portion of scripture that I have always as a young boy as a young minister and as a young man when I would read the scripture I would always get confused the minor prophet Hosea when he reads that you see the word of the Lord come unto him and he tells him you're going to go out and get a woman of whoredoms one who is disappointed one who has walked away from the house of God one who is doing what she wants to do you're going to go out and take her as your bride and I always used to think why why in the world to choose a wife would you get somebody like that why in the world would you go out and find that's not what you want for a wife that's not what is saying but all of a sudden I realized one day praying I, I wasn't the prophet I was the woman <laughs> amen I'm telling you, you got a different outlook on things then you realize how many times we failed God and still yet God loves us you realize how far away from God we are sometimes and God still ushers us in and says I would that you just love me as he says in Corinthians oh that you love me as in your spouses when we were engaged when we first met and you've got that giggly love that silly love that you're afraid they're going to walk away or get away so you don't let go of their hand God's saying I would that you would love me like that again I wish that you would get head over heels in love with me again that I would be your Gentile bride oh listen that when he redeemed us and we were nothing and nobody and he has done everything for us all we can do is stand back and worship and honor all that He is today. I'll stop with this. Bible said in Revelation chapter 19, all that the four at the four hallelujahs that would come from the glorified saints and they cried hallelujah to salvation all the Bible says that the true and righteous judge hath judged the great whore which, uh, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of the saints and her and again they said hallelujah if you didn't know this today hallelujah is not a word that can be deciphered into any other language and if you go and speak in Tagalog it's hallelujah if you go and speak in French, it's hallelujah. If you go and speak in German, it's hallelujah. If you go and speak in Mandarin Chinese, it's hallelujah. There is no interpretation into another language except for hallelujah and not hallelujah, hallelujah. And here he says that all oh, this, and he heard the voice that came from the throne saying, Praise God, and all ye servants, ye that fear him, both the small and great. He said, I heard the voice of a great multitude, the voice of many waters the voice of a mighty thunder saying hallelujah he said uh, he said for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth he said let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready and to her he was granted that he should be arrayed in fine linen clean and white for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints I'm telling you I'm glad he took a Gentile bride. You say, what's the similitude to Joseph and Christ? Everything. Over 150 sometimes you'll find when Joseph is the picture of Christ. He was rejected by his brothers, but he took a Gentile bride. Hallelujah. Jesus was rejected by his own, and he took a Gentile bride. He didn't need no one's permission. He'll not ask for anybody. <laughs> he took his own permission under the own authority of his own begotten Father, the one who sits and reigns in heaven, He gives us the ability today to accept this gracious gift by God's gracious blueprint that He's given to you and I. Would you hear me for just a minute and I'll quit. I feel myself coming to a close. If Joseph had not obeyed God, he would have stayed inside the pit. He would have been in the Potiphar's house and never made it past the prison. But if we'll obey God, He'll take us all the way. I'm not interested in giving up part way. I don't want to say, you say, is there prisons in life? There certainly is. Is there pits in life? There certainly is. But thank God one day after a while, I'm headed to a palace. Hallelujah!
Hallelujah. I'm headed to a place where there's no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more pain, no more suffering. Hallelujah. I'm headed to a time I'll be the Gentile bride that stands before Him and says, Worthy and holy is the Lamb of God who is worthy of all of praise and honor and glory. And we stand before Him clothed in a white raiment of the righteousness of the saints. We'll be that Gentile bride that day. I hope, I hope that you know Him. I hope that you've accepted His gracious blueprint for your life. I pray because until you do that, you'll never have His gracious blessings in life. Or you might have some good days. You might have some fun times. You might think that you've lived it up. But I promise you, you've never felt the gracious blessing that comes from God. God saved me as a 19-year-old boy. If you would have asked me, if I would live in West Virginia and pastor what I feel is the greatest church in the world, I would tell you you was crazy. My dad was no preacher, no pastor, not a deacon, nothing in the church. He liked to sing a little bit. And I find myself under His gracious blessings every day. And one day after a while, I'm longing to see the bride or to, excuse me, to see the groom coming. A groom coming that will take His church away. That we'll be ushered and ready to meet Him. we found that Joseph finds himself reaching the pinnacle of success under Pharaoh's hand. Joseph's now made it to the palace only because he didn't stop while he was in the prison. He could have sat in the corner and not served. He could have got his feelings hurt and said, God, where are you? He could have quit somewhere along the lines of the pasture field to Potiphar's. He could have thrown up his hands and said, I'm going to be lackadacious. I'm just going to be lazy. I'm just going to try to go with the flow. I'm just going to be like everybody else. But thank God, Joseph continued. And now he's found himself in the palace. I'll leave you with this. If you're not in the palace, if you feel like you're in a prison, if you feel like you're in a pit of life, it's not time to quit. It's not time to stop. It's not time to slow up. It's time to continue to endure. It's time to continue to love as Christ has loved. It's time to continue to do what God has purposed in your life because it's only when we continue to serve, to love, to go, and to do that God can move us to the palace. We stand across the building tonight. You're lost and need a Savior. You need to come. God can never pour out His blessing upon you. God can never move in your life the way it needs to be moved. God can never do those things until you first have grace, grace's blueprint in your life. Until you accept the Lord as your Savior, God's gracious blessings can never be in your life. And you will not be a Gentile bride. You will not be part of those who are ushered into heaven. You'll not get to heaven by good works. You'll not get to heaven by associations, by family members. You'll not get to heaven by being prayed out of some place to get to another place. The only way you'll get to heaven is by accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior, believing that He died for your sins, that He arose three days later, and now... He sits on the right-hand side of God making intercession for you and I. If you're lost, while they begin to sing and play, come tonight. In church, if you find yourself in a pit, you find yourself sold out of the pasture field, find yourself in a prison, and you'd like to come pray, God help me make it to the palace. Come tonight while they sing and play.